everybody listening, we appreciate you joining us for The Last Storm. We you, you. we have just completed talking about so many different other things on our podcast, No Offense Sports. Check that out if you want to hear about things like Roger Goodell and potential <laughs> compromising photographs that we have seen. We've also discussed Russ and his career and how it's looking toward the end but at this point what we want to talk about is the thunder so we appreciate you guys joining us oh yeah we talked about Monty Bates give you some good arrest tips if you ever get yourself into the spot where you're caught with weed or and or a gun not that we know about either of those situations but all I'm saying is going forward we're talking thunder and I just wanted to start out talking a bit about once again a Facebook post I'm sorry <laughs> sorry YouTube posts. My apologies, and I did not give yes. credit to the um, to the well, guy who he is. He is our buddy on Twitter, by the way. Now, right, right, Chris Tanak, right. Um, shout out to him for his comments. He added another comment. We, we talked about his comment last time, so this is just us talking back and forth, and you guys get to learn what we learned because he keeps telling us stuff that blows our minds. And one of the things he told us this last time was this: talking about the post Westbrook roster creation and comparing it to position this is a quote positionless team is not a novel strategy over the last years and ball creation by Jokic Jens Simmons but Presti has taken the five man on court to an entire roster two ways um how is drafty speculative players G leads etc there we go and then he said, see, 1970s Dutch soccer with their captain, John Cruyff, which changed much of soccer team strategy, and they called it total football. And so I read <laughs> some about total football, right? And it's this theory that any player can turn into an attacker, okay? And they fill in the position behind them with a player who understands multiple positions, right? Sounds a lot like what we're talking about with the Thunder. I was listening to Andrew Gaze talk a bit, and he he played for Seton Hall and played. I didn't realize this until I was listening to him talk, but he played for Seton Hall, the 1989 National Championship, and P.J. Carlissimo was coaching that team. They were underdogs. They were picked to go, I think, the second last in the Big East, and they made it all the way to the National Championship game. And he was a big part of that team. And I think this, you'll, you'll watch the game, and I was watching that game, and a guy gets a rebound, and he stands there, right, and he waits for the point guard to get the ball. The point yep. guard comes and gets the ball, dribbles up, initiates the offense, right, and everybody only does what they're supposed to in their role. That's not how basketball goes anymore. Whoever no gets the rebound runs up the court with the ball. And as they're talking about this, as, I'm sorry, as Chris was talking about the 1970s Dutch um, soccer, and it didn't start there, but that's when it became famous because they won multiple championships in a row. It started back in the 30s and 40s. It was really interesting to learn, and it's like this is the type of innovation that we had. It reminds me when we started this podcast, bro, you were bringing up Branch Rickey and comparing um, Sam Presti and his use of the um, farm system in I think St. Louis minor leagues to yep. the way that Sam Presti is utilizing the, like the thunder or the G league and, and the blue as like kind of like the same thing. And we're, we're watching that innovation. Well, this is a innovation on court. It's happening between obviously Sam Presti, Mark Degnall and each of these players. And, and you see it like with the player and I'm rambling, I know, but I'll, I'll let you, as soon as I no, mention no. his name, I'll let you take it. But Isaiah Roby, when we watched the Spurs, you saw him out there doing the same things. Grab and go. Same things all of our guys do, but he understands. Get the ball, get up the court, and it was great to see Isaiah Roby playing for the Spurs. Yeah, it really was. It was great to see Isaiah Roby. I'm I'm sure he's doing great out there. To play with Popovich his last year, I I hope Isaiah Roby really uh, eats that up. And what a gift from Sam Presti to be able to do that. Um, I say gift from Sam Presti, but we all know it. Look, anyways, look, Isaiah Roby, no doubt, will be a better player for this experience. As much as I want him to be successful and be on our team, I'd rather him because Popovich will instill things, and he'll he'll tell his grandkids about the things Popovich taught him. And like, sure, that's great. We we 
we you talked about it, you know, with the Dutch team and, and calling it total soccer or total football. I, I look at what this team is starting right now, man. And it's the beginning. And yes, we've seen it happen before positionless basketball. We've seen teams do it. We've seen LeBron teams go to championships with it. I, I, I look at what's happening with this team. And the fact is, is that it's unlike any other team. Because even with positionless basketball, you still had a big man out there that was yeah. primarily a center. I, you Have we ever seen a positionless basketball without a true center? We, even the Golden State Warriors, they always had a true center out there. You know, slow the game down or bump right, and, and we grind, can run whatever. out three, six, ten guys, and any of them can cover a center. But we don't have a center in our offense traditionally when we when we yeah. do that. It's a forwards. It's forwards, forwards, forwards. And then even looking at Shea, and uh, some teams that you know would look at Shea as a you know hybrid small forward shooting guard. You know, and some teams will look at Josh Giddy as a hybrid, uh, you know, small forward, uh, point guard, whatever. Like, that's the thing about this team. It's, it's like the, you know, a masked team, essentially. It's like, what mask do we have to put on today in order to be the best team? Like, what do we have to do to be able to be the best team? What combinations do we have to have? Because we can cover that. We got Jalen Williams covering one part. We got JRE. We got Baisley. We've got, you know, Poku. We've got really good defenders out there. And people can talk shit about Poku all they want, but we've seen a massive improvement in this, this preseason. And I know. I, well, I, I don't get the obsession with talking shit about the guy that was the youngest player in the draft, the fifth youngest player last year. And all of a sudden it's like, well, now when he's about average for rookies, He's like starting to look about above average, and they're like, "Oh, we're already done with him." Like, but this goes back to the the whole farm system. Right. Sam Presti had an opportunity to draft a young player, to draft a player that was incredibly young, and he said in his mind, "It's better for me to draft this player and and have two or three years with him before his rookie contract is up, have two or three years of developing him." And he did the same thing with Baisley, you right. know, like. He, he's shown that going through the farm system and going through the development aspect, he's willing to do. And that's how we're going to get players like Jalen Williams and Ojman Jang. And, you know, like, this is for real. It's because of how Sam Presti looks at these guys. He looks at them as, okay, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to invest this time in you because in so many days and so many weeks and so many months and so many years, it's going to pay off. You know, sometimes we're not going to see one of these guys pay off. Like, we're going to have to see maybe Baisley or somebody else walk. And it's going to suck. But it's going to have to happen eventually. Right. But it's going to come from somebody else that is either young or not even on the roster yet coming along and, you know, surpassing things. And we see signs of it. I mean, man, how great of a game was it for, like, J-Dub against the Spurs, right? And Or for Trey Mann. Right, like Trey Mann last year was capable of having moments of greatness. Like, I know that the word greatness, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, but it, you know what I mean. Like, he had what I would say, uh, like an elite step back, right? And sometimes when he would get on that role, right, it would be like, wow, this guy has a chance to be really special. You'd see like some of the athleticism with with his dunk, and you'd be like, yeah, well, how, why isn't he doing these things? like more often, like combining these elements of his game more often. And then all of a sudden he comes out this year and you're like, this guy is squared wow. away every possession. He's making the right decision. Even his misses look good. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, like, so he's exceeded. I, he was really good, but he's exceeded my expectations in the summer. J dub yeah. coming in is exceeding my expectations. And then last episode we dedicated and rightfully so to Usman Jang because like these guys weren't the main these these guys are like not the main thing it's supposed to be giddy it's supposed to be sga and chet yeah i'm talking about these other three guys that if i was another team i would be incredibly enthusiastic about but they're like it's hard i don't want to even put a number on the depth chart but like they're working their way up but it's yeah. 
a rising tide floats all boats and everybody's out there working their asses off and i and i love it i love what jang brings to the table i love j dub I, I, obviously dude i could talk about trey man for hours dude yeah it, and you look at it and, and having guys that can come off your bench that can score 17 and 11 um trey man had 17 uh last night and uh jang had 11 like this is big and i i listen to some people talk and that you hear them say stuff like oh there's no way that jang can come out and average 15 points a game you know there's no way that trey man can come out and average 18 points a game and i'm looking at it and i'm like i i understand what they're saying and i can respect it you know there's probably a very s slim chance that jang comes out and scores 15 points a game or trey man comes out and averaging 18 20 points a game but let's just say things go right and things seem to be going right right now for these young men right we are on a right now a 10 to 14 man rotation if these guys start playing like this and they yeah. start scoring at 20 points or 15 points a game that 15 man rotation is going to all of a sudden look like eight or nine men because if these guys are playing this well that means everybody's playing that well and if everybody's playing that well then we're we're going for the playoffs yeah and that that 15 man rotation is no longer anymore it is cut and it's cut thin and it's making look at like you know we've got 40 points a game coming off our bench i mean look i get what you're saying um but i wonder like i feel i feel like what like shortening the rotation to this point where only a few guys are getting minutes at the end of the season and making a push for the playoffs would be a little bit like a scotty brooks move where like and one of my questions about why maybe we needed to move past scotty brooks was his um maybe his inability or his lack of care for developing the end of the bench and I, sure. that would be my main concern with with a move like that um but i think you're right in, in some regards for sure about when it comes to um the whole the entirety of of the situation i think those things can happen for various reasons, right? Like injury or um, like some of those two way players, there's limitations. I'm not exactly sure what, well, you know, what I, I look at the bench now. though, man. Right? right. Right. All right. So check this out. The bench, you have your main three players coming off your bench. Typically with the thunder, you have your main four guys that are coming off the bench. They're going to take a majority of your minutes. Okay. Right. And then there's going to be the sprinkle all around. All right. But when I say shorten up that rotation, that's all I'm saying is like you're going to see who your main go getters are on that 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 second bench. You know, mm -hmm. like if if listen, if Osman Jang's coming out and averaging you know three or four points a game, he's going to be more in that developmental stage. You know, yeah, uh, getting that sprinkle in here and there. Whereas if he comes out averaging 12, 14, 15 points a game, he's going to be up towards that that 25, 30 minutes a game because we have minutes to give to the top you know four or five guys on our bench like yeah. that like we can give them as many minutes as we want because we are only going to be expecting 25 to 30 minutes out of these starters in the beginning of the season absolutely man and it's interesting man it's it's interesting to see how it will break down because in the end minutes for young players are the lifeblood of development and seeing how those are divvied out is really important for understanding how the organization prioritizes development. And one of the guys that has surprised me, but I really think he's going to be a big part of um, at least some of the games that he gets an opportunity in because of the way he plays and he's impactful is Omarui. He oh, I like him. uses his so physicality, good. right? He's one of those mm. guys who's overlooked because he's not as tall as what you would need, but he's committed to the game. He plays at a high level. I think there's been this concept with, with Sam Presti, right? Oh, Sam Presti has a type. He likes tall players who can't shoot, right? I've heard people use this stereotype a lot, but I would say this. Sam Presti has a type, right? It's Lou Dort. It's Kenny Hustle. Amarui fits this mold. It's not a couple of players. It's this constant desire to find people who understand their role and are stars in their role. And I'm jumping around, but let me ask you this, dude. If Lou Dort, if Sam Presti had a chance to draft Lou Dort, um, with knowing what he knows, how high do you think he gets drafted now? Right? Oh. It used to be like, oh, like he probably he'd probably pick him top ten. 
knowing he what he knows. He would do whatever it takes because he recognizes how important Dort is to this team. Right, and I think that's that's the DNA, right, of the of what he's looking for. It's once you have that, then you start seeing what we saw. Like Dort offensively has looked really good in the preseason, right? Because the process for improvement. It works well on defense. It works yeah. well on offense. It works well for shooting if you're committed to learning and improving. Some people hit plateaus, but some people understand you can always improve. Our organization combines that with people who are hungry, and whoa, look what happens. Yeah. Man, let's get back to talking about the game real fast here. I I know everybody is going crazy about Jalen Williams, J-Dub, right now, and for yeah. good reasons. His game was insane. Uh, what he did uh, last night was just spectacular. And, and if you look at combined what both Jalen's did, uh, Jalen Williams did, I, again, great job by both of them. Great job on defense. Great job on off, um, offensive boards. Like, they just did a really good job out there. And, and I like to be able to put both Jalen Williams uh, together in this because, you know, when they're standing sitting next to each other on the uh, stat sheet and they both say forward next to them. Yeah. It's pretty crazy, man, because uh, let's just go through it. JRE, power forward. Jalen Williams, or J. Will, forward. Jalen Williams, J. Dub, forward. Lou Dort, small forward, and Josh Giddy. They still have him listed as a shooting guard, but we all know he's that point guard out there. Um, just an unbelievable job by this team. But Josh Giddy, man, 25 minutes, 18 points, two steals. His defense is spectacular out there. His long, long arms really create an issue. Six assists. Six rebounds, three of which were offensive. And what my favorite stats are is his shooting because it looks great. Two for three in free throws, two for three in three-pointers, and seven for 13 in field goals. He missed some contested layups and some contested shots, but I feel like his shot selection is, is unbelievable. And last night, man, I, I, I just I marvel at Josh Giddy. Yes, we can sit here and talk about Jalen Williams because he's a rookie, but – Really, Josh Giddy hasn't had a full NBA season under his belt yet. So I, I look at this and I'm like, holy cow, like what's happening with Josh Giddy is truly spectacular is he's learning how to make a shot better. He's learning how to be more effective on the drive. His passes are truly insane. All of his assists that are one handed, left handed, right handed, doesn't matter. Throwing over his head. It's crazy. The amount of our uh, 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 passes are in his arsenal and yeah. to me i i can't get enough about of it and it, again i understand we have all these other podcasts are going to talk about Jalen um williams and, and spend a ton, ton of time talking about him but i wanted to just give a huge shout out to josh giddy because i feel like a lot of people are going to overlook his game because they're going to be looking at you know j-dub and i want to spend time just talking about and raving about how he's changed this um summer his body uh, I, I feel like even maybe even a half more inch the way that maybe it's just his hair bigger, but I don't know what it is, but he just looks so much more fluid, so much, you know, taller, so much bigger than everybody else out there. And it's truly spectacular seeing him uh, just standing out there. And it's like, holy cow, all the other point guards are like six, three, six, four. And Josh Giddy's at like six, eight, six, eight and a half. And it's, it's crazy, man. I'm, I'm so incredibly excited about the season for Josh. Yeah, absolutely. And normally we'd be showing some highlight videos, but preseason games don't always have those available and we we're having trouble finding those today. But we'll get back at it. Regular season's on the way very quickly here. Um, I wanted to make a note about number 10 for the San Antonio Spurs. And with his dyed hair, Sohan looks a lot like Dennis Rodman wearing number 10. And I was just... Like he does super short shorts and his defensive prowess. And when he decides to go get an offensive rebound and he, he attacks the board downhill, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, they found another Dennis Rodman. I know he started out with a different team. He didn't have his hair dyed when he started out. But when you see him in that number 10 with the Spurs, you can't help but think of, of the old worm, the worm. All right. But you got some out for that, Dave? Yeah, man. D didn't we do a uh, uh, something about Jeremy Shohan when he was drafted? I think we did. I think he, we we tried to cover all the the lottery, man. At least, yeah. And he was 15. he was one of our favorite guys when we watched him play. Like just the way that he hustled and all that other stuff. I'm I'm gonna go back and listen to that episode because I get I get excited when you see these young men 
that are figuring out how to play in the in the league. And and having again Popovich as your coach like this, and and Isaiah Roby is another one of those guys that are having this opportunity to get to be with one of the greats in their young career. Um, yeah. This is going to be exciting for these guys, and I'm excited for Shohan. I'm excited for Roby. I'm excited for um, one of the youngest players in the NBA still, which is um, the point guard over there for uh, Primo. Um, oh, you know, I I'm love Primo. Primo. Oh, my God. Yeah, we were big on him in the draft. I felt like if we didn't do well in the lottery selection, which we ended up with number six when we got Giddy, I felt like if we if we were outside of that situation, he probably was a major target. And, man, he looks oh, really yeah. good. He looks really He's good. so good. And it's yeah. just exciting so, yeah. seeing these young such a men that are face. having this opportunity with Pop. Yeah. Absolutely, man. It's it's important, and it's gonna we're gonna see these players playing, and they're gonna pass those that knowledge on for future generations, and it's it's pretty cool. You know, I mentioned earlier I was listening um, to Andrew Gaze talk about you know playing for Seton Hall and PJ Carlissimo, but he went on to win a championship with the Spurs, and he was talking about when he coached, how he would always be thinking, what would Pop do? So playing even for one year, even though it wasn't that like he was a significant part of that team, as he put it, not me. I think everybody's a big part of a team. But he learned so much that he was able to pass on to the future generations of Australian youth. And that's, as we talk to a lot of people in Australia, they love following their athletes as they go around the world, but they also love it when they return and teach the youth what they learn. That's a big part of the culture. And we appreciate that because that's how knowledge is shared. And, you know, we're all Absolutely. about that shit, dude. That's what – gets us excited man now i mentioned earlier that we usually will show some videos um i'm gonna go ahead and show one if you're listening you know great if not i'm gonna make sure i include this link in the clip but um here's the deal right i noticed when i was watching the pistons game um i went ahead and looked at all of the steals that we were able to get in that game and one thing i noticed that was really really interesting is this defensively in this game j dub was everywhere j dub jalen williams from santa clara is much better defensively than anybody thinks get ready Way for me better. to prove it here we go he's in the middle of everything his length he's deceptive see how he's disappearing oh okay. yeah oh yeah okay so it's, steal that. it's insane man Whoop. another one I mean, this is Isaiah Stewart, Cade Cunningham. He's breaking up. He's breaking up passes. He's going and getting, dislodging the ball. He's dis disrupting the offense. He's creating opportunities. He's in the middle of everything. And nobody's talking about his defense right now. They're like, oh, yeah, he's so elite offensively. No. Defensively, he is in the middle of everything. He makes players do things they don't want to do. And then once they're doing things they're uncomfortable with, he finds ways to create opportunities. He is potentially... Dave, are you ready for it? He's yeah. potentially our best defender already. You say, well, what about Lou Dort? Damn. Well, well, here's the thing about Lou Dort. He doesn't have the length. J-Dub, Lou Dort will hold his own against the best player. But are you going to ask him to go out there and get steals? No. But J-Dub is everywhere, bro. And at this point in the game, he wasn't playing much. Do you, okay. My question... My question for you, though, is that can you put J-Dub at that forward position, that power forward position? All right, so draft process, post-draft process, summer league, you asked me that question, I'm, I'm laughing at you for even suggesting it, bro. Like, that's how stupid I am, okay? But look, <laughs> we just showed some videos of the Pistons, right? Yeah. If you say, like, who are the two players that you like the most on the Pistons? Like, you would draft them if you had – the higher pick, right? I, I know everybody likes to get on Cade's dick, and rightfully so. He's got a nice dick. I mean, shit. But here's the deal, right? My theory is this. Who are my favorite players on the Pistons, dude? Who? I like Isaiah Stewart. Yeah. And shit, he, his name just slipped my mind, Sadiq bro. Bey. Sadiq Bey. Thank you, right? I, you know, my favorite guy, too, yeah. These guys are the guys that I want to build an organization around. And when yep. I look at the Pistons, I think... How can you have high picks, which they do. they got players out there with high picks. they got Sadiq Bey and Isaiah Stewart, who are great role players. But I don't feel good about that team. Yeah. Why? 
because I feel like all the shots are going to the players that it shouldn't be. They're going to yeah. the young players like, oh, yeah, well, we want Cage shooting this. We want this person doing this. We I like Jordan person. Ivey over there, too. You like Jaden Ivey, and I'm with Jaden Ivey, yeah, Jordan Ivey. I'm good with him, okay? But in my perspective, his best attribute is defensively. He can create disruption and get, create turnovers and get going the other way as fast as anybody else in the league right now. And just some preseason games observation. I'm not sure. saying anything for sure. But my point is, if I was running the offense and it was an equal opportunity <laughs> offense, I'd be getting a hell of a lot more out of Isaiah Stewart and Sadiq Bey. Those guys, when I look at it, I think they fire me up. I would love to have them on my team. We won't get them. But if we could, I'd be excited. And if we did get them, it'd probably be past their prime. But, yeah, dude. I mean, if you – jumping back to that Pistons game, although that Spurs game deserves a lot of talk, a lot of great buskets, especially Giddy shooting the ball. But we don't want to get too excited about the preseason, right? That's the key. I mean, Jalen Jalen did score – Jalen Williams, J-Dub, scored 12 points in the fourth quarter, yeah. which was unbelievable. Like, right. Closing Creative. out for us. Right. And, but J-Dub in – the game against the Pistons, right? He had a dunk that was from a step inside the free throw line. That he he got it blocked by who? Isaiah Stewart once again, right? I'm all over him. But my point is, he showed off his athleticism in a way I haven't seen from him before. He rose up, and if it wasn't for impeccable timing by Isaiah Stewart and using like perfect, you know, technique, that was going to be. One of the great preseason dunks of of this year. I haven't seen very many great dunks. And yeah. I feel like w- when we look at J-Dub, bro, when we talk about it, we just watch all these defensive highlights. And we, we know what he, how a- athletic he can be. Like, like, are people talking about him being a future all-star? Because people are talking about Usman Jang being a future all-star and SGA being an all-star coming up and Giddy being an all-star. Like, how many all-stars can we have on this team? I, I've said it before is that it's going to come to a point where we're all of a sudden looking at this team and we're saying, which ones are we going to pay and which ones are we not going to pay on this team? Um, you look at J-Dub, Osman Jang, you look at, um, you know, Trey Mann, uh, J, Jalen um, um, Williams, J-Will, J-R-E, uh, of course, Giddy. It's going to be intense because in order for us to be able to get to this point where we can pay them all, the, the the salary cap cap has got to be increased so much that it's, it makes sense to be able to do that. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, how many all-stars can we have on one team? And I think we could have four. I think there's an opportunity for us to have four all-stars and maybe a bench player that happens to be, uh, you know, uh, the sixth man or something like that. But, um, yeah, I, I think it could be one of those situations on our hands where, in the future, we could be looking at a, you know, Chet, uh, Shea, uh, Josh Giddy, um, and J Dub as uh, all stars. So, you know, Mark, you're just getting back, but I'll go through that that list again. I think that you got Josh Giddy, J Dub, um, Shea, and uh, I just missed somebody there. And J Dub, J Dub, whatever. There's four guys that I just mentioned there that I think they could be all stars all at the same time. So and, let me ask you oh, this yeah, Chet, question. Shea, J-Dub, right. um, and Josh Giddy, uh, And that's not with it bringing Dort in the, in the picture, but those four guys, I feel like they could be all stars all at the same time. Right. And to do that, to have that many all stars at the same time, you basically need to be a championship team because those are the only teams that get that many all stars. So then the unfortunate conversation that we hate going to is, is it more likely to have these multiple all-stars with or without SGA? And that's what, like, we've heard some people talk about. We've even indulged in that conversation. But we dipped the our truth toes is, in. what? We dipped our toes in that conversation. Right. But the truth is, the team is better with SGA, right? Now, J-Dub or Usman Jang, they might have higher ceilings. If the, all of a sudden we were like, you are the guy now, right? But in the end, this is – it's a team sport. So if we're going to have multiple all-stars, it's because of team success. And that's why I look at it and I'm like, maybe in the past we would have been like, it's either or, right? But now we look at it and we say, with patience, with enough time, right? Right. And with the optimistic 
mindset that says challenges aren't always bad things. And as sure. bad as this thing was with Chet's injury for everybody's expectations and Chet, Chet's just uh, trajectory, it just suddenly seemed like, wait, what's going to happen now? Other people are going to have opportunities to step up. You're Chet right. will be fine. And because of this, we've seen it happen time and time with sports where the team is better for the adversity only if they prepare the right way. So that's that's what I'm hoping, right? Sure. And and, and in order for us to get four all-stars like that at one time means that we'd have to be uh, a championship caliber team. And to me, that's happening. Uh, we can sit here and talk about all these people that are starting to come out of the woodworks that are like, oh, this team could actually make the playoffs this year. Like, shocker. And then, you know, they had the audacity three months ago talking about this team being a, a tanking possibility. And listen, there's a lot of craziness going on right so, now. Yeah, Jake Fisher talking about it. But yeah. Whatever. And, and and that's what I'm saying is like at this point right now, to me, it's, it's exactly what Sam Presti said at the end, beginning of this year, which was we assess every year the same way. We go into that with whatever will happen this year will happen. Because if you look at the reality is that if Shea gets uh, injured, if Dort gets injured, if Josh Giddy gets injured, then yeah, we're not going to be going to the playoffs. We're going to be looking at this at a different you know situation, different eyes. So that's what I'm looking at. It's like we'll know within six months what's happening. Because in six months, we're going to be talking about playoffs or not playoffs. And – that's 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 when we'll really know. Now, yes, we'll know probably in February if this team is going to you know make a push for the playoffs or not. But really, in six months was the time that we're going to be knowing this team is going to do this or not. So, I wrote this big giant board. Okay, when the summer league was over, okay, and I got my whiteboard and I wrote down the days we had episodes before the season starts. Okay, and we're down to it, bro. Our next episode is the last episode before the season starts. Now, more Crazy. has happened in that time than we could have imagined. I remember concluding when I wrote that, and we even talked a bit about that on the podcast. I said, no news is good news. Well, there's been some bad news since the summer league ended. But we've also made some improvements, and now we're all over not just podcasting, but you know, we're on YouTube and <clears throat> we've expanded what we do, right? We don't just talk about the Thunder anymore, which is fun. We love talking about the Thunder, and we always talk about the Thunder perspective, but we like talking about some other stuff. We just figured most of the Thunder fans wouldn't want to hear us talking about the Yankees or football or Roger yeah. Goodell being naked in Playgirl. These things aren't their interest, so we put that on a different podcast. So if you join us for the Thunder podcast, The Last Storm, thank you. If you join us for both, thank you again. Double thank you. We love you. We are enjoying this. This is a lot of fun, bro. I feel like at this stage, when we get on to podcast right now, I feel like you and me are getting together with a couple hundred of our best friends every single, well, a few times a week. Let's put it that way. I'd say three times a week, we get together with several hundred, maybe thousand friends of ours all across the world and we talk about our favorite subjects so yeah and, and they make it alive bro and that's the thing is we are interacting with every as many people as want they as want to interact with us you know whether that's on youtube um wherever that's at like we have a deep desire to to communicate and and hang around you guys like as we're sitting at a bar and enjoying a beer right now and having a conversation because to us that's what that's what happens you know i to me, it, it's amazing to be able to read uh, all these comments we're getting on YouTube about uh, the different stuff and, and really enlightening us enlightening us on so much going on in, in the world. And I love it, man. I love being able to have – we had Chencho on our last episode, which is amazing yeah. to be able to have. You I'm know, still buzzing from Spain. the high of having Chencho on. That was some great fun. Yeah, and I want to – like to me, like this is what it is about for us. It's that community. We want to be able to have you guys, be able to talk to you guys and – you know, like, I understand that some people, if we ask you to be on the show, they're like, oh, I have nothing to, to, to offer. But listen, we, we want to talk. We want to talk thunder. We want to talk sports. We want to talk whatever. All we want to do is is communicate. That's what we do. And that's why we really enjoy having listeners like you guys, because you guys have really made a difference in our lives. And getting all the love and realizing that we get 
so many hundreds of people on every single episode that listens to us is, is truly spectacular, and it, it really means a lot. It does. And never forget, never forget that you complete me. All right? Thank you for joining us. We love you. We're there for you. We can't wait to talk to you. Show up. All day. Say something. Even if you just say, you're invited to my wedding. We appreciate that. Which we've been invited, Mark, by the way, just to let you know. I know. And I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't be able to make it, but I'm looking forward to seeing the pictures. Send them. Hell yeah. Send it um, anything. Dave will buy you something in your wedding re- registry. That's right. There we go. We love you. We appreciate we it, guys. We'll see you Monday for the last podcast before the Thunder season starts. Let's shock the world, baby. Thunder up. <laughs>